such a blast off. Here we are. <laughs> Hawaii, the state of clean energy on a Wednesday, the last show of our day on any given Wednesday, our best and our flagship show. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and uh, today we're going to talk about principally wave upon wave of wave energy for Hawaii. <laughs> with Pat Cross, property, or rather a project manager of HNEI, the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute. Fabulous. Welcome to the show, Pat. Thanks. But we're not going to talk to you right now. Got it. We have something <laughs> else. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we have Lisa Harmon from Hawaii Energy. And you can talk about a special training program. It's all about education, isn't it, Lisa? That's right. That's right. What are you doing? Well, at Hawaii Energy, just want to let every, remind everybody that we are the ratepayer-funded conservation energy efficiency program, and we help all the folks in um, Hawaii, Lanai, Maui, Molokai, and on Oahu. And we've got a clean energy ally program that, Jay, that supports our um, trade allies out in the marketplace. The contractors, electrical mechanical contractors, the um, HVAC and lighting designers, building owners, and we support them through professional development workshops. That's one of the ways. And we've got Mark Jewell from Selling Energy coming back to visit us for some more workshops September 9th through the 14th. What is he going to cover? He's a very good speaker, good teacher. He's an excellent speaker and teacher. And we've got um, two new workshops. The first one is Mastering the One-Page Proposal for selling energy efficiency. And the second one is cross-selling efficiency and solar solutions. So we want to educate folks on um, implementing energy efficiency before they go to their renewable energy projects. Is Rob DeVera Turner going to be there? Rob, is, Rob will be there. He's always course. there. He's with us always. <laughs> He's everywhere. He's everywhere. The guy, I don't know how he does it. Well, I think education is very important. And, and uh, the remarkable thing is is how people need education. I don't know if it's only here or elsewhere. Um, at the noon hour, I went out with one of our uh, other hosts, uh, uh, Kirsten Turner. Mm -hmm. um, she does a show about um, sustainability. And, and uh, we took our camera out on Bishop Street, and we asked everyone oh. we could find the same question. The first thing, I have to say that <clears throat> of the people who we asked, only a small percentage would talk to us at all. Even though we had a big flag there, you know, <laughs> Think Tech Hawaii. But most of them would avert their eyes or walk the other way, and, and they, they wouldn't talk to us. Oh, got to go somewhere, got to pick up the kid, you know, the, the dog and the homework, and oh, I can't talk to you now. <laughs> and that was, you know, that was interesting. And then, and then we found that the people who would talk to us were uh, either people, you really working to blue-collar people, or uh, hippies. You know, mm -hmm. uh, young millennial types, uh, or uh, serious senior business people would talk to us. But middle class people, you know, the people who work in the offices downtown, they, they were the ones who wouldn't talk to us. Then I want to tell you that the number of people, oh, the question that I mentioned was, what does the word sustainability mean to you? Mm. Of the people that did talk to us, I have this on film. <laughs> A very, we, we did it off Jay Leno, Leno, you know, it was the whole thing was mm -hmm. jaywalking. Uh, <laughs> Jay walking. If, if that Jay can do it, this Jay can, can do, do it. it. Right, yeah. We found that uh, of the people who actually talked to us, a relatively small percent knew anything about the word sustainability uh, or how what it meant to them or how you practice it. Mm -hmm. And it was really, you know, I mean, there was some that were brilliant. Uh, and, that we, you know, wish I'd said that, but for the most part, they didn't have a clue. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe they were nervous uh, in front of a microphone, but gee whiz, I, I was, it came down to, um, we need to train people, we need to educate people in the state. We need to educate them about not only sustainability, but about energy. And what you're doing uh, with uh, Jewel and, and all your programs are so important. Right. We really need to train everybody right. and expose them to have them think about these things. We're never going to get through the energy initiative until we do that. You know? Yeah, and energy efficiency is a great first step to take toward, towards sustainability. So mm -hmm. yes, absolutely want to help educate all the rate payers out there, and especially for the people that are providing the, um, the sales and services of these products, you know, helping them sharpen their skills, sales skills and how to um, speak to the business owners and relate to the energy savings in quantifiable terms for that business owner. That really brings a lot more value. So as much as we can do along with um, 
you know, promoting uh, or so helps helping to sponsor the Mark Jewell workshops. Yeah. So uh, how can we sign up? How can we get involved? How can we go listen to Mark Jewell? <clears throat> well, some of the other classes I'll mention quickly. Learning to see that selling efficiency effectively. That's a great class. It's a, a one-day um, sampler course, and it's Mark's um, very strong suite. It's an overview of the efficiency sales professional training. That's on Wednesday the 9th. And you can go online to hawaiienergyworkshops.com. Folks can go on there to sign up, or they can call 808-333-7225 to register themselves. Is that your private line? That's the private. That's the, um, the bat line, yeah, to uh, energy efficiency. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember Kurt uh, Kawafuchi, he was the director of taxation, and he got up at one of our programs, <clears throat> and he said, you know, I'll help you. I'll, I'll actually talk to you. Director of taxation. And I'll answer your questions. Everybody say, yeah, sure you will. Yeah, you and, you know, seven layers of bureaucracy. He says, here's my cell number. And he oh, and all the pens and pencils came out. And he did that more than once. So, okay, that number one more time. That number, 808-333-7225. Um, and, of course, they can always call Hawaii Energy directly, too. That's at 839-8880. Very well. We're happy to help them. So. We'd love to see you or um, at our, any of our workshops. Okay. One more time, the website. HawaiiEnergyWorkshops.com to sign up for the Mark Jewell workshops that are coming September 9th through the 14th. Some great topics. I mentioned some of them. We also have a financial analysis training course. That's going to be a hands-on full-day course for um, sales professionals to really walk through Mark's financial analysis steps and learn how to uh, best present your sales proposals. Lisa Harmon, Hawaii Energy, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And at this point, we take a short break so we can switch out Lisa for Ray Starling, okay? Uh, and, and also say hi. We'll be right back. <laughs> hi, I'm Donna Blanchard. I'm the host of Center Stage here on Think Tech Hawaii. Center Stage airs every Wednesday at 2 o'clock, and of course, you can check out our archives on YouTube or on Think Tech Hawaii anytime you like. Why should you do that? Because this is an arts show that I believe is making a difference in lives. We talk with uh, artists of various ilk. We talk with painters and, and writers, playwrights, novelists, poets, sculptors, dancers, um, you name it, directors, uh, uh, actors, of course. And we don't only talk about what people do, but we talk about how they do it. And my favorite part of the conversation, we talk about why they do it. And it's really common on this show to hear people say, wow, I didn't think about it that way. And it's very common to hear people afterwards who have seen the show say the same thing. And I hear all the time that people are inspired by the conversations that we have. So why don't you join us and be inspired too. That's Center Stage on Wednesdays at 2 o'clock. We'll see you Center Stage. How you doing? I'm Gordo the Tech Czar here on Think Tech Hawaii, where we co-host Hibachi Talk, where we talk about technology and bring in all kinds of cool guests. Also, my co-host with me today is Andrew, Andrew, the, the, Andrew the Security Guy. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching Think Tech Hawaii, and thanks for watching Hibachi Talk. We also have Angus. And you there, lad? It's Angus. I bring in all kinds of wee things. Oh, look, you see my lips moving. <laughs> <laughs> Aloha, my name is Miley Scarpino, and I'm the host of the Empower Hour. If you're interested in health, nutrition, fitness, here on the island of Oahu, want to learn more about places to train at or different trainers available, then watch my show on Fridays at 3. We have a great time, and I hope that you'll come join us. Much aloha. Now go get swole. Last off, part two. <laughs> Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Pat Cross of HNEI, project manager there, and of course, my co-host Ray Starling, who just took Lisa Harmon's spot, and we feel that despite the, the different, you know, impressions they give, it's okay for Ray to be here. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Jay. I'm uh, happy to be here. So let's talk about wave energy. You know, it's been around for a while, um, but it's had its <laughs> challenges. HNEI is working on it now. Give us a status report, Pat. Uh, wave energy has been around for a long while, as long as we've had an ocean. But uh, what's 
relatively new is serious modern attempts to convert that energy into electricity. Um, and so let's see, status update uh, right now is that there is no commercial wave energy production in the world. In the world? In the world, oh. right. There are places that, including now Hawaii, where we are actually sending electrons to the grid, um, but you can't, it, it's all pre-commercial. It's all not ready for prime time as yet. Yeah. Very early in the, in the emergence, we hope, of this new source of energy. So, you know, a, a lot of people say it could be the big deal. Uh, there's a lot of waves out there, a lot of energy in the ocean. There's a lot of waves. The, the, uh, the wave energy resource, the, the, the potential, the theoretical potential, is enormous, which is why, despite it being a very difficult challenge, engineering-wise, um, people are pursuing it because the reward is potentially great. Yeah. So what's holding it up? It takes a lot of capital uh, to build a wave energy device and test it in the ocean. Um, you can you can create prototypes and put them in wave energy or in wave uh, tanks around the world, but really to start proving survivability and long life uh, and real world performance, you got to get it in the ocean at some point. And most of the companies involved in this are small. They don't have much money. And they need investments from government and, and private investment to, to make a go like, like others. But they need a lot of it. They need a lot of money to get something of the scale where they can really prove it out in the ocean. So uh, um, there's a certain amount of research and uh, testing that still has to be done. But on what? I mean, what are the technical challenges they have to overcome? There, there are still many, uh, to be truthful. Um, just just the, the physical survivability of a device in, in a rough ocean is, you've got, you've got, for the most part, a wave energy conversion device is going to have moving parts. And it takes advantage of the motion of the ocean to, to uh, do various forms of power takeoff. But those are all physical systems that have to be prepared to move around in the ocean and do so for a long period of time. So they tend to break so far. So there's just durability efforts that need to be done. But there's also things like corrosion and biofouling that are inherent to anything you put in the ocean. Um, and those may or may not affect the performance of the device. Um, so there's research there. There's research oriented around the potential impacts, environmental impacts, uh, in the areas where they're deployed. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of work to be done before we're ready to commercialize wave energy. You know, this reminds me of a visit I had to, uh, to NILHA, uh, the uh, National Energy Laboratory of Hawaii Authority, one of the most obscure and unpronounceable uh, acronyms I have ever heard, Nel Ha. You have to breathe into it, yeah. Uh, anyway, there's a, there was a, what do you call, what's that uh, technology? Um, OTEC. OTEC there. And uh, in OTEC, you know, they had, they had, the time I visited, they had different kinds of metals. It was material science question. Yeah. Uh, that were, the, there's a special part, a transformer type device um, heat exchanger. Heat exchanger, yeah. thank you. Yeah. And the heat exchanger could be in this metal or that metal, and they were sure. testing all these metals. Mm -hmm. And the, the one that worked best uh, was titanium. But titanium is very expensive, and so they were looking for something cheaper. Aluminum worked well, too, but it, it couldn't resist the corrosion. Um, and, I mean, it was all a question of material science. Aluminum mm -hmm. yeah, does fairly well and is much less expensive, yeah. but not yes. quite as good as titanium. Yes. Yeah. HNEI so, is actually involved in that. Is that right? Mackay Ocean Engineering yes, does right. most of that work, yes. but they get some of their funding through <clears throat> through us. Yeah. So I mean, I'm, you know, that's, that's it's it's ocean equals material science problems, mm -hmm. uh, corrosion and material. So it's the same issue, isn't it, as as uh, OTEC? Well, it's, it's there's certainly that similarity. Yes, you've got to be able to survive in a corrosive environment. Yeah. So yeah. 
Well, I, I'm, I'm sure there are all kinds of other issues bringing it together, but before the show began, or this part of the show began, Ray was talking about uh, a facility that he'd seen 15 years ago in Scotland. Scotland, yeah. yeah. What was it like? Well, it was, it was a great trip to just to find it because uh, it was on a very small island called Isla. It's spelled I-S-L-A-I-L-S-A, -A, Isla. And it, it's uh, uh, famous for scotch. Sc very famous. <laughs> we found out. You Thank take you. A, uh, it's a family show, Pat. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, it, we, we, we took a ferry over, and on the ferry, um, you know, people started talking to each other, and come to find out, everybody else on the ferry was going over to um, to imbibe with the scotch <laughs> over there. And we were the only ones going to look at this wave plant, which nobody had ever heard of. And uh, when we got there, it took us a while to, to find it. Um, yeah, there were no signs, and uh, we, we knew kind of on a map where it should be. And we stopped a farmer, and uh, he said, yeah, oh, you're on the right road, just keep going, and you'll hear it. And boy, did we hear it. Mm -hmm. What uh, was the sound you heard? It, it, it was, in effect, uh, a jet engine that was not, uh, this, the turbine was turning, but it wasn't because of a flame inside a combustion chamber. It was just turning, and so it made a, it made a sound like lots of wind mm. moving back and forth. And what it was was they had built um, a concrete bunker right at the waves uh, or at the ocean's edge, and when the, when the water would come in, underneath uh, there was an opening, and it would, it would rise up, and it would compress the air inside this concrete chamber. And up at the top, they had basically a, a jet engine that didn't have a combustion chamber. So all it was doing is just capturing the wind as it was going through. And it would, as the wave would come in and compress the air, it would blow this way. And then when it would go back out, it would suck it back. So it was an oscillating sort of thing. And uh, it, it was... Blow it hole had, in reverse. Yeah. Yes. Well, <laughs> <laughs> it was actually producing power for the island. And uh, it was only like 50 kilowatts, I believe. But uh, it, it, was, it was... Do <laughs> it was doing... <laughs> Yeah, so we, uh, we, we took a look at that, and uh, it, it really uh, it kind of inspired me uh, to, uh, to look at alternative energy sources. And uh, uh, so I've, I've been up and down and all around, but um, I'm really on the energy efficiency side of things, yeah. uh, the megawatt. So, but, that, you know, there have been so many attempts, isn't it true? I mean, there was one, you know about this one, uh, off the northeast um, at the northeast tip of Maui a few years ago. Cynthia Thielen was behind this. I mean, she supported it. And uh, it was Australian. Ocean Links. That's it. Yes. O o Australian uh, company put it together. And uh, high hopes, a lot of money involved. And it right. was a big, right. a big object there floating out in the ocean. And it had a lot of technology into it. But as I recall, it never actually worked. It actually never got in the ocean. Is that uh, right? In off Pauella, Maui. Uh, yeah, and and that company unfortunately is no longer with us. Uh, and that's been a challenge for wave energy right. companies right. in general is just to well, stay alive long enough to. There was one that was supposed to come here. I mean, it may have been this one that uh, in I believe it's Australia that uh, they built, and they they had it sitting there, and a storm came along and basically uh, destroyed it. I mean, literally destroyed this thing before it could get uh, put in place. Um, and, and that, you know, that's the other thing that you mentioned, you know, that you, it's got to be able to take the big storms like we've got out uh, at sea right now, uh, as well as, you know, do its thing whenever the waves are <coughs> small. So it's, it's well, a big No, there's, big deal. there's actually, uh, there's a commonality between your Scotland story and, and that device, and that is that both of those are, are what's called an oscillating water column right, device. Right, right. The, the one you saw is affixed right. to the shore, and, and the ocean links, and there's a company in Ireland called Ocean Energy that will actually be testing here in Hawaii, hopefully next year, 
uh, that are floating oscillating water columns. So it's the same thing. It's the blowhole concept. It's your yes, you're right, forcing right uh, you're forcing a chamber of air through a turbine. And, well, and wouldn't a, wouldn't a fixed piece like in the concrete that uh, one in Scotland wouldn't that be more mm, stronger? Wouldn't that you know be more resistant to storms? Yeah. And, and corrosion, for that matter, as concrete would be. Sure, it has that. Uh, there are, I, you know, there are pluses and minuses to many different concepts in terms of capturing wave energy, and certainly a plus for the fixed mm -hmm. one is what you can you can access it easily. Uh, you can access it even in relatively severe weather. And you know where it is. Uh, yes, <laughs> but you, <laughs> the the appeal to going offshore is there's more energy to capture out there, but there's more challenge. Yeah, yeah. Very exciting. But one of the things you mentioned that I'd like to cover is, um, is that it's the mom and pop problem. You know, as we've seen that in, in uh, renewables from the beginning. Uh, now, in certain renewables, the favored, the favored child children get, get the research and development money. I and mean, if you're not a favored child, you're small potatoes, you don't get so much research money, you don't have much money. And I mean, I submit going on the notion that tech will tech will cure all uh, that if you threw enough money at uh, motion in the ocean I love that term uh, then you can make it work but there's not enough money to do that True. happy to see in Kaneohe the Marine Corps and, and the Navy I suppose are putting some money into it uh, they certainly have a facility out there and have been testing and playing with it for s some years already yeah. Um, but is that enough? Um, is, is there other research and development money coming from anywhere else? Uh, are there mom and pop developers out there that are funded well enough to solve these technical problems? Uh, hopefully. There, there, right now in the U.S., the funding for wave energy is coming from the Navy through some congressional money that was routed through the Navy, um, but also from Department of Energy. Department of Energy is funding wave energy in a variety of ways, some smaller scale component studies and, and resource evaluations and stuff. But they're also funding some of the companies that have reached a, a level of maturity where a nice infusion from the government might put them up closer to commercialization. So. Yeah. So those are the companies that, and then, so both the Navy and DOE have funded companies to come to Hawaii and test their devices. And these are companies that have a concept that's matured enough to have competed well for the funding. Well, the problem is in all of this, uh, the competition, it's not competition like business competition, it's competition of technologies. And um, if I see that the public uh, is adopting photovoltaic, that's where I'll put my development money. I'm not going to fool around with something that's unproven. If I see, this is not quite the same way, but if I see uh, that uh, wind is, is popular and useful in some places, I'm going to put my money into that. Um, I have not seen that uh, uh, ocean thermal uh, is going anywhere, so I would not would you put my money into that? And I have not if seen. If I had a lot of it, I would. A lot yes. of it. If you had a lot, it wouldn't matter, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Maybe Larry Ellison will listen to this discussion. <laughs> no, I, seriously, that's what OTEC needs is is major investment to get it to the scale where it could be commercial. Yeah. And the same thing with uh, motion of the ocean energy. True. It, uh, yeah, to answer your question, there just isn't, there isn't enough money to go around. There's a lot of good ideas out there, but there's just a limited amount of federal funding, at least in our country and worldwide. Uh, Scotland is one country that's done a good job. They're, they're pursuing marine energy, both wave and tidal, fairly aggressively with the hope of sort of becoming an exporter of, mm -hmm. of that IP and the technologies. You know, it's not a comparison, but uh, we had somebody from uh, actually Blue Planet Energy on the show last week. Uh, really amazing. They're, they they came out of the press release only Thursday, I think, mm -hmm. 
and we nailed them on the same day we got them down here. How do you like, whoa, okay. <laughs> they came down and talked about what they're doing on Blue Planet Energy, which is, this is their first product is, you know what it is? Battery. Is it Sony battery, Sony, like <laughs> big credibility Sony. Uh, and it's about the size of a, a, a DVD player, okay? And it has 1.2 kilowatt hours in it. And you can stack them up and, you know, connect them all and have lots and lots and lots of them. And they will act as a battery with all the reliability of Sony. And they use, uh, I forget the name of the additional element. If you add this additional element to the, the standard lithium, um, then it doesn't get hot, it doesn't burn up. And so Sony has really gone the next leg on this. And Hank Rogers uh, is trying to market this as a profit mm -hmm. experience. Uh, he has rights in Hawaii. Other people have rights on the mainland. Sony is hitting the market with that. But it strikes me that in something like, um, you know, ocean energy, if somebody made a really high-tech, say, carbon fiber, uh, you know, resist corrosion, uh, titanium parts when appropriate, um, and, and had it modular that way, and you can stack them up or make an array across a an area of ocean, uh, either in close to the shore, maybe out further, connected somehow with a, some kind of steel connection or carbon fiber connection. Um, you could, yeah, oh, oh, it was on the TV, now it's gone. Okay, it'll come back, I feel, I feel certain, yeah, that it'll, this is the, uh, blue this is the, blue, the blue ion thing. See how they're all modular, they're all the same size, and and you put them in a rack, they work together. It's very interesting. Um, and, and he's going to roll them out, by the way, at the uh, Asia Pacific uh, Summit on Energy yeah. uh, in 10 days' time. Cool. Uh, yeah. It really is the right time to roll them. But, you know, you could do a modular thing, right? And it would be small, and it would be, you know, high-quality manufacture, high-quality materials, and then it would work. But to, to do that kind of R&D takes a lot of money. Sony put a lot of money into it. I think, well, for wave energy, it's, uh, it, uh, there, there's still so much of a wide open question as to what the technology will look like. Um, once, once one or two or five technologies really start to show promise and they work when they're made of steel in old, maybe old fashioned ways, then you can really start figuring that kind of thing out is how do we produce these things using cheaper methods and, and bring the cost of electricity down. Um, so do we have the scientific ability, the technological R&D ability here in Hawaii? Assume we have the money. But do we have the talent to do the R&D here? Or is this something that has to be done somewhere else? I, I, would, I would guess that we do have the talent in Hawaii. However, at least at this stage of, of wave energy, there are no Hawaii companies that are uh, that are pursuing anything, at least anything that's at this level of maturity where it could be tested at wets. I know there's a there's a fellow at Oceanit who has a concept, but it's never really gotten past the small scale wave flume stage. So uh, I think there's there's plenty of brain power here in Hawaii, but so traditionally it has not tackled this problem. At least on a commercial, on a commercial side. This has not been a sexy thing to do, and uh, yeah. so, and on, so on the academic side at the university, there are people who have been working the, this problem. Um, so, but not and so. when you when you think back to uh, the Wright brothers, they they funded their own from their bicycle shop. They funded their own testing and so forth. And so, uh, when when you start talking about obviously, if you've got a lot of money. That's nice, but if you don't have any money, but you've just got the will to keep testing, tweaking it, change the flaps or whatever mm -hmm. to make it work better, mm -hmm. and keep testing it, uh, you could be, you know, the the, the next uh, generation of uh, energy could production be. here. But you know, you're probably going to need some electronics in there to make it work really efficiently. That's that's the special sauce in the Sony battery. There's a lot of um, smart programming in there and it yeah. does all kinds of things. It does things that the smart grid would do if the smart grid were with us. It does things that new inverters might do 
instead of the new inverters. You know, in other words, it's like contingent technology. If you have it, fine. If you don't have it, the Sony device will do it for you. So it, it sort of fills the gap if necessary. And it could be the same thing here. You so you'd want to have uh, who knows, maybe some kind of leveling. You know, so the waves are higher now; they're lower in a few minutes. Uh, the, the tides, who knows what, would change the amount of energy that's available to generate the electricity. And uh, electronics could help smooth the curve on that and give you a, a steady, steady beat sure. of direct or alternating current. Well, ju yeah, just like with PV and, and wind, uh, wave energy is, is, is going to be, you know, irregular. Yeah. It's, it's a bit more predictable in the in the time frame of a few days kind of thing than wind and solar um, so that's an advantage but it's still an up and down source of power and there's the possibility of flat waters you know where you're not producing so sure storage storage works wonders for all these uh, all these sources of energy they go up and down it, the chemical was uh, the the element would began with a th like thorium something I forget what it was doesn't matter it was it was something new that we hadn't heard before it's a new kind of battery so it's the same thing here um, but let's let's come back after this break and talk about the problem of bad weather and storms and the great likelihood that we're gonna have big storms more you know intense storms going forward mm -hmm. and whether this is the right horse to ride knowing that. <laughs> Do I beg my own question? <laughs> we'll be right back after this break. That's, that's Pat Cross of HNEI, Project Manager, and Ray Starling, my co-host here in Hawaii, the state of clean energy. We're talking about the motion of the ocean. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen. I host Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii, and I do this because I care about science literacy in Hawaii. I want to spread the understanding science is a vital and interesting part of everyone's life. I want to make sure the broadest possible spectrum of people understand the beauty and the value of science and realize that science plays out each and every day of their lives. I want you to understand that science is fun. So we bring on to this show each week guests who are scientists, from astronomers to zoologists, and we talk about what they do and how they do it. But most importantly, we talk about why you should care about their work why you should see that their work has value and impact on your life. So I hope you'll join us Fridays, 1 p.m. here on Think Tech Hawaii. You can watch us via live stream. You can watch us uh, recorded on Olelo. And you can see us uh, each week. We hope you'll join us. <laughs> OK, That's scary. we're back, we're live, <laughs> having a wonderful break, <laughs> finding truths you would never believe. <laughs> so climate change, <clears throat> you know, it, I mean, it, it amazes me that the media never actually connects all these really intense storms with climate change. They sort of leave it to the public to think maybe, oh, this could be climate change. It's happening all over the world. I mean, you could make a chart and a graph every day about this, and the media never really tells you. Uh, but, but I think for this discussion, let us assume that we do have climate change, that it's getting worse for the lack of a resolution, uh, and that as it gets worse, there's going to be you know, more inclement. Can I use that word, inclement weather? <laughs> How about really bad weather? Um, and bad weather is one of the problems about motion in the ocean, isn't it? Sure. Yes. And uh, I, the, the possibility of more frequent hurricanes, tropical storms, wherever they are in the world, uh, is I, I think most expectations and most models have those increasing in number and intensity. Um, but really, it just, uh, it, uh, we already have the problem of being, of needing to survive in rough conditions. And for the most part, wave energy companies that exist to date are, have been going after parts of the world with, with big waves yeah. because they want to extract as much energy as they can. To so they're off the coast of Scotland and they're off the coast of uh, Ireland and Portugal and, and Oregon. Uh, and that's sort of what they're designing toward. But there's, 
there's also a place, uh, uh, we think, um, for designing systems that would extract energy in much less energetic wave environments. But then, even if you're operating in a less energetic wave environment, perhaps in the tropics somewhere, you might have to survive a hurricane or a typhoon or a super typhoon. So, yeah, it's the problem's really already there. Is you've got to be survivable in the maximum expected conditions for the area that you hope to commercialize. And so, fortunately, we have a lot of data in most parts of the world to tell us historically what the wave environment has been, including the extreme events. And so you've got to design your device to those extremes. And now if, cli if the climate change is going to mean that we have more extreme events, or then, then you might have to go back to the drawing board, but uh, hopefully you have some, yeah. some wiggle I guess, room. I guess <laughs> what I'm saying, though, it's really an interesting thought is that we still have, you know, various options to develop R&D possibilities. And at this point, climate change seems to be clear. And the increasing uh, intensity of these storms also seems to be clear. Therefore, in selecting, you know, the horse you want to ride, in developing the R&D for that horse, you want to make sure that the roof stays on. You want, to, you want to build it in such a way so that it has resilience, may I use that word? <laughs> resilience against increasing storm intensity. Yeah. And so, I mean, no I'm, not, I'm not saying that this is the worst possibility. And, you know, if you don't build, for example, a, 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 a PV farm so it'll stay on the ground, um, you know, if it flies away in a heavy wind, you know, you have the, the same problem. The storm killed the renewable energy. But you know a lot about storms, don't you? Tell us about your background, Pat. Tell us how you got to be where you are today. Tell us how you got in the studio here today. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody asked me to come, and here I am. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, just real quick. I was a, a METOC officer in the U.S. Navy. Uh, that's uh, meteorology, oceanography. I started out in submarines and, and got uh, some advanced degrees along the way in oceanography and meteorology. and. Uh, I retired from the Navy and worked for a small company for a while doing underwater acoustics mostly. So I really don't have a background in uh, renewables or in energy specifically, but I do in the ocean. So, uh, so I, I don't know. It's a, we all take different paths. So, no, it's uh, true. And if yeah. you looked at the Energy <laughs> Policy Forum and uh, you know rolled back the so there's uh, I don't know hundreds of people attached in one way. Or the other to the energy pot, or the industry. Look, the industry in a way. Um, Ten years ago, none of them had any background, really. Very, very few. That's right. Well, yeah, I, I went to a, a, a marine energy conference shortly after coming aboard with HNEI, and I made the comment to someone that uh, I, I'm, I'm new in this field, and he said, "Look around. We're all yeah, new we're in all this new field. Too. <laughs> it's a new so, field. So. Yeah, you're not <laughs> handicapped in any way." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but it's interesting how there's an intersection here between weather and, um, and renewables. Not only in this particular uh, opportunity, this, this option, but in all kinds of other options. So <clears throat> I guess what I see is, well, what is HNEI, your project manager? Some of your projects must have to do with this. So what is HNEI doing right now about motion in the ocean? Good. Thank you for asking. Well, well, just a quick orientation on the on the test site itself. It's it's a wave energy test site, <clears throat> the infrastructure for which has been put in by the U.S. Navy. So it's the, the infrastructure belongs to the Navy. The funding for companies to come and use that infrastructure is coming from both Navy and DOE, and both of those entities, Navy and DOE, are also funding us H at HNEI to support. Um, that effort in in a few ways. Uh, one is to do the environmental data collection. So we're we're putting acoustic sensors down, uh, hydrophones. We're listening to the ambient noise conditions, but also to the sounds that are produced by these these devices. Um, and we, in the future, we hope to be collecting electromagnetic field data that may or may not be detectable from the cables to shore. And from the devices. Uh, I understand that the sound picks up the sound, and it sounds like this 
the difference between here in Scotland that is in Scotland, it's got the whirling turbine sound as a kind of a Scotch accent and in the US. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> True. Yes, no, I, What's a hydrophone look like? Does it look like a cell phone? You know? A hi no, a hydrophone looks uh, like a like a like a big a oh. bigger version of this. It's okay. a, it's <laughs> Does it have email on it, for example? <laughs> It's like a microphone, only okay. it's in the water, so okay. it's a hydrophone. Okay. <laughs> uh, so anyway, collecting, uh, we're doing, we're sending divers down and looking at the ecosystem around the devices. Uh, we're looking at possible changes in sediment movements around the devices. So that's the environmental side. We're monitoring things to inform future regulators who might have to make a decision as to whether a device or an array of devices will have meaningful or harmful in impacts. Um, but we're also acting as sort of a third party independent validator of the performance of the devices. So rather than just taking the word of a, of a company on how their device is doing, we uh, as an academic entity will, uh, will validate that performance and, and provide those results to our sponsors mm -hmm. and hopefully publish to the broader community. Mm -hmm. um, per agreements with companies oh, that great. we have so, on privacy and that sort of thing. Yeah. But uh, so we're the, uh, so we're, we're, we're looking at power performance, but we're also looking at what we've been talking about, which is just durability and survivability in Hawaii's wave conditions. So now, one thought, uh, uh, I'm interested in your reaction to this. Traditionally, these devices have been connected with surface motion, not motion down below. Uh, and it's right. It's the surface is moving more than anything else. The surface is for moving. for the most part. Yes, yeah. there so, are some people who are looking at pressure differences with devices under okay. the surface. Seems um, to me, if you're looking to avoid extreme weather or extreme wave action, you know, such as might break the thing in a million pieces, you go where there's less violence, uh, and the surface is where the violence is mostly. Uh, so if you went down below the surface, it wouldn't be have to go too far down. Uh, you know, just 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 what, five or ten feet maybe would be enough. Uh, you could get a, a softer, kinder kind of motion. No, there's there's definitely something to that. There's an Australian company called Carnegie Wave Energy that has subsurface floats that are swaying in the waves, but they're away from the most energetic surface. So you lose region. something. You lose some energy, but you maybe you gain in survivability. So yeah, yeah there's. That's what I mean by, by all these open questions. Yeah, um, yeah. So. Well, Ray, it's that time again for you to try to make sense of <laughs> all of this. <laughs> well, yeah, we appreciate Pat coming uh, today, and uh, we'll have to have him back to talk more about uh, what he's doing there at uh, Kaneohe Bay. And um, is this the first type of unit that you've been associated with? Um, in, in your project management? Well, yeah, I guess uh, to this point we haven't even talked about what's happening now, which is that we do now have, you mentioned in years past there was a company called OPT that, that uh, deployed a device at WETS at the 30 meter berth. The Navy has now added two new berths at deeper water depth, 60 and 80 meters. Um, and so you know, there's three grid connected berths mm -hmm. in place now and, and we have the first wave energy device now deployed at the site, again at the 30 meter berth the, uh, from a company called Northwest Energy Innovations. That just went in the water in late May. We've got company number two, which is a device from a Norwegian company called Fred Olson, uh, which looks nothing like the first device. Mm -hmm. uh, it will go in at the 80 meter berth uh, as soon as the end of September, probably more like October, mm -hmm. sometime in October. So, uh, and then we've got three more devices slated for the coming years. Uh, and the schedule is still pretty And the, these are all tough to figure. Uh, pushing electrons, as you said, onto the grid, right? There. Yes. Yeah. When they're working. When they're working. Well, yeah, I mean, this, where are this, they? this physically, first, where are they? physically, right off the end of the runway at Kaneohe Bay. Um, <clears throat> and, and fairly close to shore. If you have an opportunity to go to the base, and stand on about the 16th tee of the, of the Clipper <laughs> Golf Course, you have a great view of the device that's out there now. Right, right. Um, okay. And it is sending electrons to the grid. That's 
Okay, right. we'll have to leave That's it great. there. That's uh, Pat Cross, HNEI, Project Manager. This is a, a moving target, but we'd like to move, move with you and learn more about it as it goes forward. Here in Hawaii, the state of clean energy, Ray Starley and me always looking, learning, finding, discovering, and getting excited about all these possibilities. Motion in the ocean.